If you read the medieval sources for Norse mythology, like the Eddas and Sagas, you'll encounter a lot of familiar sounding creatures. Frost giants, light elves, dark elves, dwarves, trolls. And thanks to centuries of European folklore and modern media based on it, you might have a pretty solid image in your head of what these creatures look like. However, medieval Scandinavians did not read Tolkien or play D&D, so their conceptions of these beings would have been very different from ours. And that becomes quite evident when we disregard modern fantasy tropes and just look at what's in the text. In this video, I want to go over over each of the terms for mythical creatures that I just listed and see what they meant in the context of Old Norse literature. You'll find that, unlike in a fantasy tabletop or video game where each race has a clearly defined appearance and set of stats and abilities attached to it, medieval folklore leaves things much more vague. If you clicked on this video hoping to gather info for your historically accurate homebrew campaign, you're gonna be very unsatisfied with the information that's actually available. Now before we get started, I gotta tell you about this video's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Just like this channel, Brilliant.org is all about learning things in a fun and engaging way. But unlike this channel, the things you learn with Brilliant are, you know, <clears throat> actually useful. Brilliant is an online learning platform that provides thousands of hands-on, college-level math and science lessons meant to help sharpen skills and satisfy curiosity. Everything from algebra, statistics, physics, computer science, and much, much more are all available in beginner, intermediate, and advanced courses. Having spent my college years mainly learning how to make silly drawings move, I've been hoping for an opportunity to continue my education in other areas. With Brilliant, I've been having a blast with their science lessons made in collaboration with Kurtzgazat. Wait, is that how it's pronounced? Kurtzgesagt. Oh wow, I actually nailed it. With their easily digestible lessons, I've gotten to learn the basics behind things like super volcanoes, black holes, and even what humans would have to do to one day turn Mars into a habitable planet. And there's so much more waiting to be learned with Brilliant. If you want to start your journey today, you can visit brilliant.org slash jakew, or click on the link in the description. And the first 200 of you to sign up will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks so much, Brilliant, for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to Norse mythology. The creatures we hear about the most in Norse mythology are the frost giants, the sworn rivals of the Aesir gods. When we hear frost giant, we typically think of big blue barbarian guys with horns, but no being like that is ever actually described in the Eddas or sagas. The word in Old Norse sources that is often translated to giant is Jotun, and that word doesn't actually imply anything relating to size. The best English translation modern scholars have come up with for it is devourers. While there are some Jotuns who are explicitly described as being super super big, like Ymir and Utgard Loki, this is definitely not a universal trait among their kind. For most Jotuns in Norse mythology, their size is never mentioned, and nothing about the way they interact with other characters implies there being a significant difference. The prefix frost, as in frost Jotun, is also not universally used, and when it is, it doesn't seem like it's meant to indicate them being made of ice, or having ice-based elemental powers. It might just be meant to refer to the environment they live in, or the fact that they descend from Ymir, who was born out of ice. Ultimately, the Jotnar should not be thought of as a different quote-unquote species than the Aesir and Vanir gods. If they were, that would mean two of the most important gods, Odin and Thor, were technically at least half-monster. Obviously, that's not how they were viewed by their worshippers. The Jotnar are simply a third clan of gods, or at least god-like beings, who are often at odds with the other two, but can still procreate and intermarry with them as we see happen all throughout Norse mythology. The reason we've come to think of Jotuns as monsters probably has to do with the fact that they're usually playing the role of the villain in Norse myths. We have a natural, if not problematic, tendency to imagine bad guys as being physically ugly or even inhuman as an outward reflection of their evilness. So it's easy to imagine how the monstrous traits of the Jotuns became exaggerated over time, to the point where we see towering giants like Utgard Loki and whatever's going on with Tyr's grandmother. And a word commonly used for the nastiest of Jotuns was troll. That's right, in the Old Norse language, the word troll doesn't mean lumpy monster living under a bridge, or really anything super specific. Troll was just a fairly broad derogatory term, kind of like how it's used today. A troll could more or less be anything evil and scary, whether it be a Jotun, a sorceress, a ghost, a wolf, or even just a person with nothing supernatural about them. Moving on, mentions of elves in Old Norse sources are sparing and extremely vague. The most we can gather about them is that they're some kind of divine or semi-divine beings who have a close relationship with the Aesir and Vanir, and unfortunately none are described 
described as having pointy ears or luscious flowing hair. In the Eddic poem Grimnismal, it's said that the Vanir god Frey was gifted Alfheim, home of the elves, as a baby. So it may be that Frey was considered their ruler. Dwarves, on the other hand, show up quite a bit in Norse mythology, and they have a number of recurring traits. Generally, they are seen as short humanoid creatures who were born out of Ymir's corpse. They live underground or inside stones, and many are known to be skilled craftsmen who created some of the god's most prized possessions. This conception of a dwarf is not at all far off from the modern fantasy dwarf, but this is not the only form they appear in. In the prose Edda, Brock and Atri, the dwarves who made Thor's hammer, have a third brother named Al, who's literally an Al, a simple tool used for leather and woodworking, and they use him to stitch Loki's mouth shut. In the saga of the Volsungs, there are multiple dwarves who appear to be humans, but who have the ability to transform into animals. We even see the lines between dwarves and elves become blurred. In the Eddic poem Volunderkvitha, the main character Volund is explicitly described as an elf, yet his defining trait is his skill as a craftsman and inventor, which is typically something you'd expect from a dwarf. Looking at all these attestations, the impression we get is that elf and dwarf are kind of just generic terms for a broad array of magical beings. And while there are shared traits among these creatures, they don't adhere to any super distinct categories. This, however, didn't stop Snorri Sturluson, the author of the Prose Edda, from trying to create classifications for them. In his work, he divides elves into two categories. Light elves, which seem to be the mysterious semi-divine beings described very sparingly throughout Norse sources, and dark elves, a term he uses interchangeably with dwarves to describe the crafty guys who live underground. This is a good example of what I mentioned in another video, where Snorri seemed to take a lot of disparate myths and tried really hard to fit them into a single unified worldview. We've carried on this tradition and developed a whole taxonomy of distinct mythical creatures. Extrapolating from the limited information given in Norse mythology and other folklore from all over the world. And the fact that ideas can morph so much over generations is of course not a bad thing. It's just, you know, how humans work.